That's fine, okay. thanks. Alrighty, welcome back. You're watching a uh, whopper of a Wednesday edition of Stop the Steal TV. Mm -hmm. I'm joined, uh, thankfully, by my uh, partner in crime, my dear friend, the host of The Other Side of Midnight on WABC Radio. Frank Morano is with me. Where you can hear John tonight, beginning at 2 a.m. That's right. And um, we're joined right now um, by the author of, uh, co author of A Basket of Deplorables, i.e., Trump fans. Uh, Dennis Carston joins us right now. Dennis, how are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? So uh, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to uh, write about this basket of deplorables. Well, I, I'm a retired lawyer, and I started writing novels just for the heck of it because I wanted to try it. And I've written a series of uh, courtroom dramas and murder mystery type books, and I sell them on Amazon. A fan of my writing is a woman named Sarah. She wrote me after reading one of my books. This is the one, Political Justice. Um, and she asked, she knew Linda Tripp. She asked me if I would send a copy of that book to Linda, because it's about a couple, a uh, governor and his wife, who are very driven, obsessed by, coming, by becoming president for money and power and well, it sounds, it sounds an awful lot like the Clintons. So I sent this book to uh, Linda Tripp, and she read it. She wrote me an email the next day after she read it and said, first, her first question was, why aren't you at the top of the New York Times bestseller list? And I said, well, you know, I'm working on it. So anyway, she had never really wanted to do a book about her experience. But about 10 years ago or so, one of her grandchildren came home from school and they had apparently been discussing this in, in school and her name came up and her grandson asked her, Grandma, are you famous? And it kind of slapped her a little bit. It's like, oh no, I, you know, the kids are gonna learn about this. So she, she started writing her memoir and it was originally meant just for family, just for future family to understand what she did, what she went through, what she saw. But then after she contacted me, she brought this up and she just asked me, she said, you know, you're really right, Will. Would you be interested in helping me put my memo together? And I said, absolutely. And I actually kind of had to drag her to it because I think it's a, an important part of history. It's something that needs to be told. Most of these books are people who go and they'll interview others who were there and get second and third hand knowledge of what was going on, not just in the Clinton White House, but any of these kind of books. Linda literally sat in the middle of all this and saw it all firsthand. Her, she was uh, an assistant to uh, Vince Foster, who was the guy who committed suicide. And her Allegedly. cubicle was like 15 feet from Hillary's front door, from her, from her office. Wow. So this is a firsthand, you know, look at the whole business. And trust me, it's a lot worse than what you think it is from what you've, from what you've learned. These Den are two very flawed people. Dennis, how did Linda justify uh, secretly recording Monica Lewinsky in phone conversations in which uh, Monica Lewinsky thought they were private when Linda Tripp knew they were being recorded, uh, which was a crime in the state that they were done uh, because this was a two-party consent tape. Did she have any, at the very least, remorse or guilt about one, betraying a friend, and two, breaking the law? Uh, one betraying a friend, yes. But the person that convinced, look, she didn't immediately, she didn't know, back it up just a little bit, she did not know Monica when Monica was in the White House. By the time Monica went into the White House, uh, Linda was back at the Pentagon. And then by just total um, coincidence, um, Bill Clinton decided Monica had to go to get rid of her, so they shipped her off to the Pentagon, and she ended up in the same office with Linda. So then they were, they were, Monica couldn't keep her mouth shut about this. I mean, she talked about it constantly on the job. And after about a year of this, 
a story came out in, in Newsweek by um, Isakoff. Michael Isakoff, yeah. Yeah, and that's when Linda's, a friend of Linda's, a woman that Linda knew said, you know, you really need to protect yourself from these people. And that's when Linda started to do the recordings, was his friend talked her into it. And her friend, this person, gave her bad advice, actually, and told her that one party um, recording was okay in Maryland, and, it, and she just didn't know better, okay? So she recorded all this stuff, and I've heard some of these recordings, and believe me, folks, you don't want to listen to this stuff. It's 90% Monica whining about her boyfriend and her job prospects, and 10% Linda listening and acting like the big sister. Well, what boyfriend but, was she whining about? Bill Clinton? Uh, big, President, uh, Clinton. President Clinton? Big, big, Linda, Monica Lewinsky truly believed that Bill Clinton was her boyfriend and that after the, what was it, the 96 election, she was going to go back to the White House, Bill was going to divorce Hillary, and Monica and Bill were going to get married and live happily ever after. Wow. That's how delusional this kid was at the time. Well, was she, she delusional or was that, but or was Bill Clinton telling her that? Well, when you're 23, 24 years old, you know, I mean, how do you know? Well, when, when this all started, she was 21 and she was actually a very naive 21. But be that as it may, I don't think Bill told her this. I think this is just a fantasy that she conjured up in her little head. But she truly did believe this. And after the Isakoff article came out and Linda Tripp's name came out, because Linda Tripp didn't actually help Isakoff all that much, but it looked like she did. And Hillary, hell hath no fury as Hillary Clinton, okay? And so to sort of protect herself, to literally protect herself, she started recording uh, Monica Lewinsky and all these recordings and eventually dumped them on Ken Starr and his investigation. Got but it. that's how all that came about. It wasn't like uh, Monica, or not Monica, Linda just decided out of the blue to start recording this. She did have a reason for it. And the reason was because of uh, the vindictiveness of Hillary Clinton. This, wow. So she no really, so does all mean, this great presidential scandal ultimately started um, because Linda Tripp thought that her life may be in danger from the Clintons. Someone left a note on her desk, on her chair, mm -hmm. about the people that have been killed around Hillary Clinton and the, and the Clintons. And it was, it scared the hell out of her. Okay? Now, whoever, she never did figure out who left that note. But it was, a, it was meant as a warning, and she took it as a warning and decided she better do something to protect herself. Wow. Now, I don't know that the Clintons have ever had anybody killed. I wouldn't begin to suggest such a thing. But they have people who are willing to scare others into, into uh, being um, loyal to the Clintons and things Understood. like that. So she, I think she had good reason to be concerned. At the very least, her job and her livelihood were at stake here, too. She had been with the government for like almost 30 years. And she, you know, so she had been a government, long time government employee. She was a single mother. Her, you know, her life and her pension and her retirement were on the line. So there, she had reason to be concerned. Let's Understood. Okay. Uh, Dennis Carstens, co author of A Basket of Deplorables. Uh, Basket of Deplorables is being released posthumously. Uh, Linda Tripp, sadly passed away in April of 2020, but I encourage you to go out and find out the real story behind Linda Tripp, Monica Lewinsky. Uh, Dennis, thank you very much. Have a happy yeah, Thanksgiving. It is it is available now on Amazon for pre-order. All right. Get out there uh, on I Amazon I'll, and get I it to somebody for a Christmas gift if you want to know um, what was going on in different heads in the uh, Oval Office. We'll take it's a quick break. Read, we'll come back and uh, well, thank wrap you guys. up. Nico Romano's Final day as senior producer at Liquid Lunch Stop to Steal TV. <laughs>